Welcome to today's Lunch and Learn. I'm Lisa McDuffie, the president and CEO of the YWCA of Northwest Ohio, and I have the distinct honor to wear a dual hat, serving also as the chair of the Health Equity um, Committee of Healthy Lucas County. Let me start with the YWCA. We are dedicated to eliminating racism, empowering women, and promoting peace justice, freedom, and dignity for all. It's a perfect combination to collaborate with Healthy Lucas County. Let me tell you just a little bit about them. Under the leadership of Director Jan Ruma, um, they were formed in 1998. It is a coalition of community organizations working to improve the health of all Lucas County residents. Healthy Lucas County performs a triennial health assessment with data that is collected on behalf of children, youth, and adults, and it develops a three-year community health improvement plan and strategies and action steps. The coalition is especially focused in addressing the needs of residents living in low-income areas, lessening health disparities, to help everyone live their fullest potential. Healthy Lucas County is governed by an executive committee of community leaders. And more information, please feel free to visit their website at healthylucascounty.org. It is such a pleasure to be here today to talk with one of our colleagues here from the Ability Center. Um, as we were chatting yesterday, I'll share with you um, during uh, COVID's peak, <laughs> way back when um, there was a committee that was formed that really looked at the allocation of resources. And I want you to know it was all done uh, via uh, conference line. So we never saw one another's face, but I recognized our speaker's voice, um, Katie Hunt Thomas. She was a force to be reckoned with. Um, oftentimes, I sat on my line totally amazed at not only her position and her expertise, but her strong conviction to advocate on behalf of all vulnerable communities um, in our um, geographical area. Um, I think Katie is going to be a joy to listen to today. So her topic is uh, COVID health inequities barriers to access to healthcare for people with disabilities during COVID. Let me tell you just a little bit about her. She has quite an impressive bio. Kate, Katie Hunt Thomas is the disability rights attorney for the Ability Center of Greater Toledo, Center for Independent Living in Northwest Ohio, with the mission to assist people with disabilities live, work, and socialize within a fully accessible community. She received her BA magnum cum laude from Xavier University, a JD um, cum laude from the University of Toledo College of Law. She is an author of the Ability Center's Onstead Barriers in Ohio, the problem space by people with disabilities in Ohio and in achieving community integration the rights of people with disabilities in inclusive neighborhoods under the American Disabilities Act, Fair Housing Act, and Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act and vital connections, civil rights and public policy issues affecting people with disabilities in pursuing inclusive, accessible transportation, all of which are available on the Ability Center's website. I'm ready to hear you, Katie. Take it away, please. Uh, thank you, Lisa. And I have to say it was it was such an um, interesting and joyful revelation that we had already worked together, um, but had never seen each other's faces um, when we spoke yesterday. So how funny. Um, and that work that we worked on together um, fits directly into the topic today. So um, welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming to listen to the Lunch and Learn today. Um, like Lisa said, my name is Katie Hunt Thomas. I am the Disability Rights Attorney and Director of Advocacy at the Ability Center of Greater Toledo. Um, and I'm about to share my screen, so bear with me for a second. So 
So we do a lot of different types of work at the Ability Center. Um, a lot of folks are very familiar with our assistance dogs program, um, assistance dogs for achieving independence or ADAI. Um, we also have a community living program um, that encompasses uh, equipment loan, um, home accessibility, uh, and adult services, services serving um, adults with disabilities. Um, we have a youth services program as well, youth transition services that assists uh, youth with disabilities and transitioning um, into employment. Um, and we also have our uh, strategic, uh, strategic partnership and initiatives program where we reach out to our community and try to make them more accessible. Um, I am part of the advocacy program. So our advocacy program tries to make systems change um, to support folks with disabilities to live independently in the community. Um, the hot topic, um, of course, over the past year has been the effect um, that the COVID-19 pandemic um, has had um, on our community um, and um, on the ability of people with disabilities to remain independent. Um, so that's where we are today. Um, just like everybody else, you know, beginning um, a year ago in March, um, our attention shifted from um, systems change in many different arenas to really focusing on healthcare. Um, and healthcare has been, you know, the issue of the day um, for the past year and a half for folks with disabilities. Um, our, one of the things that we did and what I'm gonna talk about today, we'll talk about it a little bit more in depth um, as I go through our slideshow, um, is a survey um, that we put together in collaboration between um, a state committee called the Breaking Silences Advocacy Committee um, another Center for Independent Living, the Access Center for Independent Living in Dayton, um, and the Ohio Disability and Health Program at the OSU Nyslanger Center um, to more clearly gather data about the effect of the COVID-19 pandemic on folks with disabilities. Um, so we're gonna go through this. Um, we're gonna talk today about, well, number one, why, why did we feel like it was necessary to do a survey? Um, Number two, what results did we get? Uh, what recommendations did we come up with from those results? And then, you know, what's next? So a little background. Uh, we um, at the Ability Center of Greater Toledo are a particular type of organization called a Center for Independent Living. Um, you can go to the Ability Center and see our 101 year history kind of laid out on our walls. Uh, but um, Centers for Independent Living are a really particular kind of organization. Um, there are, um, there's a national network um, that connects all of the centers in, for independent living across the country. So there are centers in every state um, and we're connected by a national network. Um, in Ohio, there are 12 of us. Um, the main thing about Centers for Independent Living is that we are consumer controlled. So a majority of our staff and a majority of our board, especially in decision-making um, capacity, have to be folks with disabilities. Um, we are cross disability, so we serve anyone with a disability um, who walks through the door and qualifies for our programs. Um, and then um, we have to provide services uh, for people with disabilities. Um, our goal um, is, to, um, is to move forward with the independent living philosophy. So, we're called a center, we don't provide housing. Our goal is to provide, provide services um, that an advocate for change to support people with disabilities uh, to live in the community. Really, we try to affect the way society works um, to make sure that folks with disabilities have access to community integration um, and aren't shut away in, um, in institutions. So why, why did we think it was necessary to do a survey. Um, well, so like I said, the, um, the hot topic of the past year for everyone has been COVID, um, but the COVID uh, pandemic really affected people with disabilities um, in, a, in a very large way. Um, it is one of the populations that was most impacted um, by COVID. Um, just a couple of statistics. Um, so, folks with disabilities are more likely to live in congregate settings. So settings like nursing homes, group homes, um, uh, or you know, in, um, ICFs. And um, COVID um, 
1% of the population um, was affected by COVID deaths, but 35% of COVID deaths were in congregate care settings. Um, so there was really a high rate of mortality in these congregate care settings um, where folks with disabilities are more likely to live. Um, folks with disabilities had an increased risk of death from COVID itself. So if you go on the CDC's website, there's a very <laughs> sort of scary um, a page that talks about, uh, you know, what um, conditions make folks more likely uh, to experience serious complications from COVID. I mean, a lot of those conditions are disabilities. So um, folks with disabilities are more likely to have the high risk conditions that are listed on the website. Um, and they're just more likely to be affected by serious complications of COVID itself. Um, there's also an increase in isolation for a lot of folks with disabilities, and this will come out from the survey. A lot of folks um, who have disabilities are transit dependent and public transit services were restricted during COVID. Um, there were restrictive visitation policies. So if someone did live in a, in a congregate setting, they perhaps couldn't even be visited by a family member. Um, there was incre increased fear um, because there was an increased risk of serious complications. So a lot of folks didn't want to leave their homes because they were afraid. Um, and then COVID was affecting um, the caregivers or in-home caregivers uh, of folks with disabilities as well. And we'll talk about that a little bit too. Um, but the, um, the reduced access to healthcare um, and um, the increased risk of COVID infection and serious infection for folks with disabilities really caused a lot of issues to be uh, put under a spotlight um, in the past year. Um, and uh, even at the Ability Center, you know, and the advocacy program, we had a very set strategic plan for the year, um, and um, it was definitely disrupted, just like everybody else. We got a ton of calls about people needing job accommodations because they could not go to the workplace at risk for being at risk of COVID, um, about hospital visitation policies and group home visitation policies, um, about service dogs not being allowed in places. Um, about nursing home transitions, so folks trying to get out of nursing homes because there was such an increased risk of infection and death there, um, the effects of wearing masks and how that affects communication um, for folks with disabilities, um, and even schooling, the effects of remote schooling, both at an elementary, secondary, and university level, um, and how it affected folks who already have learning disabilities or who needed direct services like physical therapy or speech therapy. All of these issues came through our center this year, um, and there was just a huge spotlight and impact from COVID. So we got together with these other groups and decided to gather some data um, that we could use to help health departments, especially respond um, to effectively to the needs of folks with disabilities um, during the pandemic. And that goes through some of the things I just talked about. Um, in particular in healthcare, um, and we'll see this from the survey results, many people with disabilities actually rely on the healthcare system um, to remain independent. Um, and there was reduced access uh, to the healthcare system um, throughout this entire pandemic. The fallout is really gonna be felt a lot for a long time um, in the disability community. The survey ran for approximately two and a half months um, throughout our state network, the 12 Centers for Independent Living in Ohio. Um, other partners also, um, also shared uh, the survey. Um, so the majority of people who answered um, were either a person with a disability. So that was, that was almost 50% of respondents. Uh, the, a family member of a person with a disability. So that was about 32.5%. Um, and the remainder were professionals who work with people with disabilities. Um, we received uh, responses from uh, 15 counties in Ohio. Um, the majority came from Montgomery County where the Access Center for Independent Living is located. Um, most of the respondents were recipients of services from their county board of DD, um, but a large number were also recipients of services from ODJFS. 83 individuals completed our survey um, one survey was completed, uh, you know, via an actual Word document. Um, the, re the remainder was completed online. Uh, um, so, and then this lays out uh, table one, the demographic identities, which we just went through. Um, 
here's a layout of the counties um, that responded. So again, the majority was from Montgomery County, but it was really a large distribution amongst counties in Ohio. Um, Lucas County uh, and Wood County were number um, three and four, probably because we are also helping promote this survey. And then here's um, the, the breakdown of uh, where recipients were receiving services, which we also uh, just discussed. So the County Board of DD, um, ODJFS, uh, Centers for Independent Living, um, AOA, uh, Public Transit Authorities, Public Housing Authorities, and Homelessness Services. So going through the results of the survey, um, there um, were a few sort of themes that came out, and we'll talk about those. Um, but um, the survey responses themselves were pretty interesting. So the first question asked about uh, feeling fear for their lives. Um, and remember, like we talked about, a lot of folks with disabilities um, are at higher risk uh, for COVID infection because of their disability um, or because of where they live um, or even because of where they work. Um, so 60.5% of respondents expressed feeling fear for their lives during the pandemic. Um, there were some open-ended questions as to why um, they felt fear. Um, and here are just four an sort of anecdotal answers that came out um, that they were high, at high risk um, for a serious COVID infection. Um, witnessing others not taking the pandemic seriously. So for folks who are at high risk um, of a COVID infection being around other people who um, weren't engaging in safety protocols or weren't taking it seriously was really a big cause of fear. Um, disruptions uh, with in-home caregivers. So this is something we'll talk about a little bit more in depth, but a lot of folks with disabilities who rely on in-home caregivers um, found um, that they could no longer rely on those caregivers during the pandemic for a number of different reasons. Um, and then also not having PPE for themselves or their caregivers. At the beginning of the pandemic, there was really that shortage of PPE. And um, a lot of um, folks with disabilities uh, with in-home care uh, for some reason weren't prioritized um, to get PPE. Um, so a little bit more in depth, a lot of respondents had trouble getting in-home care at all um, during especially the, um, the peak of the pandemic. So over half of the respondents, 55.1%, reported encountering caregiver issues as a direct result of COVID. Um, and this has been an issue uh, for folks with disabilities, I can say the entire time that I have been um, at the Ability Center, um, but it was really thrown into light during, um, during the pandemic. 71.9% um, um, of respondents' ability to find necessary caregivers uh, was affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. And that was a question just worded a little bit differently. Um, COVID-19 was often cited as a reason there were no caregivers available. 36.7% of respondents stated that. Um, one thing I remember from the open-ended questions is that caregivers um, those was, was a type of job um, that was also affected um, pretty direly by the pandemic. So caregivers themselves um, often don't have access to vacation time or, um, or sick leave. Um, and so uh, when they um, perhaps had kids to take care of um, because the schools closed um, or daycares closed and childcare was not available, they were no longer available. Um, there were also uh, caregivers who told uh, folks with disabilities that they were afraid um, to continue with their jobs uh, because they are in close proximity to folks with disabilities in their homes and there was not enough PPE available. Um, respondents had additional trouble accessing other medical needs as well. 40.5% um, of respondents were unable to get physical therapy, for example. Um, we also had a series of open-ended questions in this survey. Um, there were six main themes that came out of there. Uh, disruption in daily activities and life situations. Issues in finding or securing qualified caregivers. Concerns, fears, and behavior health issues during COVID-19 barriers and issues in meeting healthcare needs, issues in how the healthcare system interfaces with people with disabilities, and then perceptions of the health department's response. 
So here are some examples from the open-ended questions that we pulled out and thought were particularly illustrative of some of the issues. Um, so some of the greatest needs were staff to provide care, financial assistance, uh, socialization, um, socialization routine, connecting outside the house, feeling safe um, in day hab and at work, uh, getting groceries, um, prescriptions, uh, non-medical transportation, getting supplies, masks, sanitizer, Clorox wipes, et cetera financial support and access to mental health treatment, um, food access, access to PPE, access to technology, and accommodations and doctor appointments. Um, and I would say um, uh, the Ability Center and other centers for independent living were in encouraged um, to engage in some emergency response work through the CARES Act. Um, and a lot of these things were things that we attempted to respond to as well, especially food security, internet access, and PPE. Um, so what did we do? Uh, we uh, took all this survey data and um, we put it in a letter um, that we have been presenting to um, health departments. Um, and I'm gonna go through our recommendations that we came up with. Um, we had, um, I had a meeting um, with the Breaking Silences Advocacy Committee where we went through all these results. Um, and they also shared some uh, personal um, input on how the pandemic has been affecting them. Um, and, uh, and these were, um, these are the recommendations that we came up with. Um, this is a letter we put together that we've been sharing with health, local health departments and, and some medical providers. Um, so a summary of the results, uh, the, um, the, the things that jumped out to us um, that really needed to be addressed um, were number one, the lack of clear communication and messaging. Um, so what we really heard from the survey results and from speaking to folks is that people didn't understand what was going on and didn't know what they were supposed to be doing. So, um, so for example, during our meeting, when we were reviewing the results, someone gave the example of, uh, you know, this is end of, uh, the fall uh, um, 2021, and I still don't know if I need to be wiping my Amazon packages off with, uh, with Clorox wipes. Um, there was just really this uh, uh, lack of clear communication and also mixed messaging that folks received. Um, there was kind of a sense, it seemed like that health departments thought that um, folks with disabilities all got their, their information from maybe one source. So for example, I, I noticed that the State Department of Developmental Disabilities was really great at providing information. It, um, they were on top of it and provided clear information um, you know, on regular basis, but a number of folks with disabilities are not connected to the State Department of Developmental Disabilities. Um, so really in the future, there needs to be a better messaging network devised to communicate with folks with disabilities. So that does mean reaching out to some of those state agencies um, that are generally in communication with folks with disabilities, but not everyone's connected to a state agency. So we're gonna have to reach out in a lot of different manners to provide clear communication. So uh, website, social media, call line, emails, text, television, public service mailings, um, the full network of disability services and agencies within the community, including 211, which is a big source of information. Um, for folks with disabilities. Um, also town halls and webinars with clear information are large scale efforts um, could help inform marginalized communities, not just those with disabilities about the current um, state of emergency. Something that came up really regularly was this in-home provider shortage and unreliability. Um, so there needs to be some sort of um, backup um, for a disruption of in-home um, care during public health emergencies. Um, it seems like there could be some communication and coordination between hospitals, you know, um, home care agencies, um, local nursing and SDNA programs to find backup caregivers. Um, uh, the group felt it was very um, important to note that uh, it's not um, appropriate to place a person in an institution like a nursing home um, or long-term care facility as an emergency backup. There needs to be some sort of plan when there's this disruption in in-home care um, to help uh, care for that. Um, 
the other side of that is that we need to make sure that in-home agency and independent providers and family and friend providers have access to PPE, COVID-19 testing, and vaccinations to minimize that service disruptions and shortages. Um, like we said, we noticed that the workforce uh, was disrupted um, by COVID um, and you're responding to their own emergencies, but part of the disruption was also this fear of going into people's homes and potentially catching COVID, providing care without the appropriate PPE, vaccinations, et cetera. Lack of access to transportation was another major uh, theme that kept coming up. Um, a lot of folks with disabilities are transit dependent. They rely on public transportation to get around. Um, a lot of folks thought public transit was not safe um, during COVID. Um, and um, public transit uh, hours um, were reduced, um, services were reduced during COVID as well, which trapped a lot of people in their home. Um, so whenever there's a pandemic response from the health department, um, they need to make sure that response programs are accessible to people without transportation. Um, so vaccinations, testing, um, PPE, all need to be available um, to people's homes. Um, the other side of that, the food insecurity, um, you know, technology insecurity, uh, those need to be delivered to people's homes as well. We saw some responses of folks who were unable to use food stamps um, for food delivery services, um, but were also trapped in their home without access to transportation, um, or um, just generally some folks can't get out and get to the, the grocery store at times like this. The other biggest um, area was access to healthcare. Um, so for a lot of folks with disabilities, access to healthcare means the difference between, um, between being able to live in the community um, and, uh, and being, um, being uh, routed into an institution. Um, and uh, healthcare services were difficult to access, especially during the peak of the pandemic. Um, so a couple of things, a lot of folks uh, didn't have internet connectivity um, so they didn't have access to telehealth services. So there needs to be some sort of backup or provision of internet, some, some way to assist people who need, um, who rely on uh, regular doctor's appointments to manage health conditions, to get telehealth services if they don't have internet in the home. Um, medical setting visitation policies. Um, a, lot of, a lot of hospitals, uh, group homes, um, other settings, um, nursing homes, um, restricted visitors during this time. Um, but a lot of folks with disabilities rely on a, another person to assist them in communicating. Um, so one of the examples that we've seen, that we saw during the pandemic was a person who had a son who had autism and he was an adult, he was 20. Um, he had to go to the emergency room um, and was released um, only to be, have to be go back to the emergency room a few days later um, for emergency surgery. Um, and um, he uh, was not allowed to bring his parents, his parent with him into the emergency room um, and uh, was not, unable to communicate exactly what his symptoms were um, because Asperger's um, can affect the way that folks communicate with each other. Um, so, it's a person who tends to speak in um, very short sentences in just a few words, perhaps has difficulty um, uh, putting symptoms into language um, and was not allowed to bring a caregiver with them into the hospital. And then that resulted in him being readmitted a few days later for emergency surgery. And that's just one example that we heard, um, but there were other examples that occurred during the pandemic. Folks in nursing homes who felt very isolated because they had no family, you know, folks with dementia who had one person they could remember, but that person couldn't come visit them, um, things along those lines. Um, there needs to be exceptions and visitation policies for folks with disabilities. Lack of communication accommodations. So similarly, you know, some folks, when they go into a medical setting, they need a communication accommodation. Um, maybe folks who are um, deaf or hard of hearing um, need someone to translate for them. Um, uh, masks really got in the way of folks who are hard of hearing from understanding um, uh, other, you know, what people were saying because they couldn't read lips. Um, so there need to be some accommodations available, especially in medical settings um, for folks who have difficulty communicating because of their disability. 
Um, issues navigating an emergency room or hospital admission and staying safe. Uh, folks with you know chronic health conditions um, tend to have to go to the hospital more often than folks who um, who don't. Um, they tend to have to go to emergency rooms more often than folks who don't. Um, and a lot of people talked about how um, how difficult it was uh, to have a severe health condition and go into an emergency room and be surrounded by other sick people who perhaps could or could not have COVID. Um, uh, people also mentioned those scarce allocation of resources, which Lisa mentioned earlier, as something that they had heard about. Um, so there were folks who said they were afraid to go to hospitals because they were afraid that their care would be rationed. Um, so those sorts of things need to be addressed as well. Um, something else that just came up over and over in the survey, so I felt a need to bring it up um, in our recommendations, um, was rude and unprofessional doctors or staff. Um, so, um, so people who weren't patient and trying to listen to someone with a disability who was maybe having trouble communicating. Um, this was something that was mentioned quite a bit and was actually kind of a surprise to me. Um, so I think there needs to be, one of our recommendations is that there just needs to be training um, on how to interact with folks with disabilities in medical settings um, and um, an understanding that, uh, that policy modifications sometimes need to be made um, to accommodate a person's disability. All right, I'm gonna go through these last recommendations um, a little bit quicker because I see we are reaching um, close to the end of the hour. Um, uh, but um, there were a couple other things that came out. So uh, the health department issued uh, a number of different pandemic guidelines for safety. Um, I know right after the shelter in place, there was guidelines, especially for businesses on how businesses needed to be arranged um, to accommodate um, COVID and keep people safe. Um, but those didn't seem to be taken into account with accessibility, need, accessibility needs. Um, so a lot of health department guidelines for social distancing and other pandemic safety didn't consider, you know, wheelchair dimensions or other types of disability access. Um, and so those guidelines need to ensure that they're taking those into account when they're being developed. Um, food insecurity, again, as we mentioned, was a big issue um, from the survey and from uh, folks who use the Ability Center. Um, so a lot of folks with disabilities were isolated in their home, um, either due to health fear, unemployment, um, increased barriers to healthcare, and lack of public transit. Um, so uh, food needs to be available to be delivered to folks' homes. Um, something that is um, uh, maybe something that won't be as big of an issue in the future, but is something that we should take into account. Um, is that there was really a disruption in the availability of uh, medical appointments and the switch from in-person to telehealth services. So even for folks who did have internet in the home and could switch to telehealth services, um, there, um, there was a disruption in care um, when folks with disabilities, uh, with chronic disabilities often really rely uh, you know, on medical appointments and therapy appointments to manage a disability. That was a significant barrier for a lot of folks. Um, there was discussion of resource shortages. Um, some of the folks that I spoke with actually used either medications or equipment that were used to treat COVID um, to manage their own health conditions and had trouble getting those things um, once those things were needed for COVID. Um, so I know, so a number of the folks in the group we worked with are on ventilators um, and um, ventilators were being routed to hospitals um, and they had trouble getting um, things that they needed to maintain their ventilators. Um, also folks talked about needing certain medications to manage their conditions, which were then being routed to hospitals and other medical centers. So when there's an emergency that needs to be taken to account as well, that there are folks who regularly use those supplies to manage health conditions um, and still need access to them, even though we also need to respond to an emergency. Uh, and then the final thing is the thing that I mentioned before. I think I was just so um, bowled over to see that statistic about feeling unsafe or afraid. Um, when all those factors make uh, folks with disabilities more likely to be at risk for serious complications of COVID, um, more likely to be trapped in their homes and isolated, 
um, more likely to have disruptions in their daily routines and activities, um, to have disruptions in their medical care due to the lack of in-home providers, difficulty getting to providers and hospitals, um, difficulty accessing telehealth ser services when that, those are really crucial to care. Um, folks were really feeling afraid um, and unsafe. Um, and then there was just this lack of uh, constant and clear communication about what they needed to be doing to stay safe. Um, I think the politi politicalization of the pandemic, um, the lack of clear messaging, um, and then all those factors just really um, affected the way people felt um, during the pandemic. Um, so uh, anything that health departments can do in terms of clear messaging, um, in terms of ensuring uh, the cont continuity of care um, when something like this happens, um, will really try to, will really help address that issue. Okay, so we're just gonna uh, wrap this up. So to conclude, um, what did we do with this information? So we've been working with our partners uh, to present this data as much as we can. Um, we've been presenting it to Centers for Independent Living. Again, there are 12 in the state. Um, and providing them with a survey and cover letter to share with their own you know, local decision makers. Um, we did present this um, to the Ohio Department of Health. Um, we presented this to the Lucas County Health Department and um, also our Hospital Council of Northwest Ohio. Um, and they are facilitating us to present the data at a regional meeting um, for the Hospital Council of Northwest Ohio. Um, uh, we are also um, actually next week going to pre presenting the data to the Ohio Department of Medicaid. Um, when we looked at this data, we realized that some of these are short-term solutions and some of them are longer, more systemic solutions. Um, so getting this in front of local decision makers and then also getting it in front of, you know, especially state agencies that create policy and systems, um, we found to be really important. Um, what are we hoping will happen? Uh, well, first, um, one of the things we especially talked about with the Ohio Department of Health is just increased participation of people with disabilities in local and state emergency planning, um, increased awareness of issues, you know, facing people with disabilities in emergency situations, uh, better and prompter response to the needs of people with disabilities. So uh, for some reason, uh, when COVID first happened and everything was disrupted and everyone was trying to respond as quickly as possible and in different and unique ways, it really felt like um, the state of the state of Ohio this health department was behind the ball in some of the things that we mentioned, um, communicating with folks with disabilities, ensuring that they had access to PPE, um, ensuring that things were delivered in the home, um, transportation, those sorts of things were overlooked, which again caused a lot of fear and disruption. Um, and, um, and so in sharing this data, we're hoping that in the future, and now that we see that maybe the pandemic is um, uh, continuing, um, that those things won't be overlooked or, and the response will be faster. Uh, and then just, um, we're hoping that the needs of people with disabilities will be incorporated into official emergency response plans. Um, that, that's the ultimate goal um, of what we're trying to do here. Um, all right, so I believe we also have a time for questions. Um, and um, so at this point, um, I'm open to taking any questions that people have. Katie, that was absolutely um, amazing. Um, you know, I see that we do have some questions in our chat box, um, but let me just maybe start with just an overall um, impression of everything you just shared with us. And, and it, I promise you it will lead to a question. Um, Sitting here looking at the results, one of the things that clearly came to me is the number of subsets of vulnerable populations that are amongst us. Um, we clearly have never, uh, or some of us anyway, have never been where we are today in the midst of a pandemic. Um, many of us didn't know what to do, how to act, how to respond. 
Um, but this survey certainly has shined a light on really an absence of people being intentional of inclusion. I think it's extremely telling um, the feelings and the thoughts that people shared. Um, I'm really pleased to hear that um, you are presenting this information, not only locally, but also at the state level. But I guess I wanna take it a little bit further. Um, what really is the advocacy that's needed to make sure that we really are truly looking out for individuals with disabilities and what is it, if anything, that those of us who are here and listening to you today can be a part of to help make sure um, whatever the needs are, we are addressing it. The fact of the matter is the pandemic hasn't gone away. Um, so I assume even though some of the information is in past tense, it's still very much in front of people. But what do we need to know or what do we need to do to really help in this advocacy? That's a great question. Yeah, I, um, I think when we were considering the results, we had hoped that they were in the past, um, but it certainly doesn't seem, you know, from recent events um, like that is the case. Um, and I, I think that the thing is that folks, so the biggest thing that I encounter is just this lack of understanding um, of folks with disabilities in the community. Um, you know, this lack of understanding sometimes of how to interact with folks with disabilities, of how to communicate, um, uh, a lack of understanding of the issues. Um, there tends to be, in my experience, if we're not out there kind of sh shouting, there tends to be kind of this sense that, oh, someone else is taking care of that. Um, oh, there's there's a, an agency out there, there's a charity, there's, um, you know, there are systems in place to take care of that. Um, and um, we see that with I mean, transportation, which just came up as an issue here and as a constant issue, we see that with healthcare, we see that, you know, um, and that's not the case. Um, folks with disabilities aren't out there receiving charity from some, um, you know, overarching and all-knowing charity who's just taking care of them. Um, folks with disabilities are independent and in the community and, um, we as a community have to ensure that there are supports there that allow that to happen. Um, and, um, and so I think the lack of response, especially in the beginning and the lack of understanding that there wasn't someone kind of overseeing that and taking care of it um, to COVID-19 response is just a bigger, a bigger, um, uh, you know, uh, a bigger discussion of that same issue. Mm -hmm. um, the reality is that everybody needs to think, be thinking about the needs of folks with disabilities and ensuring that they're able to remain independent. So, for example, when we're putting together an emergency plan, um, it's not, there's just not some understanding that that's being taken care of or that we can just put folks in nursing homes and they'll be taken care of. Um, I really think um, the biggest thing that we see is this lack of understanding and education. Um, so I think as advocates, um, it's important um, to uh, watch our own mindset um, and just make sure that the needs of folks with disabilities are are taking are um, on the table and taken care of. Um, that people with disabilities are present um, and giving their own voices to major decisions that you know could um, impact or disrupt their lives. Um, I think if we're um, this. Um, this uh, webinar I know is reaching out to Healthy Lucas County. So we may have some medical providers or folks who work in hospitals or doctor's offices um, who are listening. I think that they are in an excellent position um, to respond um, and have the knowledge of the needs of folks with disabilities. Um, and, uh, and I think, you know, just learning from some of these surveys and ensuring that folks are present at the table are kind of the two biggest things that anyone can do to make sure issues are addressed. Great response, thank you, thank you. Um, I'm looking through the questions and I'm gonna do my best to, to try to take similar questions and, and combine them. Um, but one question, uh, which is actually something that also came to my mind, um, but I'll uh, 
read the question from the viewer because I think they covered it a little bit more articulately than what I was getting ready to ask you. But the question is, do you know if there was an increase in death of people with disabilities as an indirect result of the pandemic because they were not able to access the care and services they needed? Yeah, and I, I don't have statistics regarding that. It might be actually difficult to collect that sort of data. Um, the statistics we do have are regarding folks in congregate care settings. Um, so, I mean, anybody connected with the emergency response in Lucas County knew that there were a number of outbreaks even in local congregate care settings. Um, and then that statistic that I quoted with, um, you know, 1% of the population, uh, there was a mortality rate of 1% of the population um, from COVID, but 35% in nursing homes um, came from the CDC. Um, so, um, I don't have the answer in terms of data for the general population, but definitely in congregate care settings, uh, you know, there was in the disability rights community, there was this big movement to get people out of there. Um, so. Sure, you know, uh, the reason the question um, was coming to my mind is because in the very beginning, um, I, I think you and many people know um, that part of the mission of the YWCA is to work toward the elimination of racism. And if you don't know, I shared it with you in the beginning of the webinar. Um, but we took a pretty active role um, in, in questioning how we were capturing the data of individuals who had lost their lives. Um, at one point, it was not um, desegregated by race. And we knew um, from our positioning that if you don't capture things by race, oftentimes, well after the fact, it becomes a little late in history. Um, we knew that the pandemic um, was hitting uh, populations of color at disproportionate rates. And so uh, we were really pleased that our advocacy uh, was heard um, I, my understanding is there were varying reasons, and so I want to be really clear on that, um, that we were told as to why some healthcare facilities um, wasn't tracking the data by race. In some instances, if people came in and there was an emergency and um, there wasn't adequate time to ask those questions that most of us know they ask at the point of uh, hitting the ER, you know, if they're in distress, you can't um, just guess what the race is, even though you may look at an individual and think you know the answer. So in some instances, they were left blank. There were many, many, many um, examples as to why they were. From our agency's perspective, we wanted to push to collect it as best as possible. Um, I think this is another one of those things um, it, it's really important to make sure we capture all that we can capture to tell the true story of people who are impacted and oftentimes neglected and forgotten. Um, so if there's a way, um, you know, that possibly even our agencies can work together, um, we look at the intersectionality of everything as it relates to race. Um, we, we center on race. Um, but everything else around it. So um, a person of color with disability, um, you know, you name it, it's, it's in our bandwidth to address that. So we'll have a, a conversation offline. And for those um, in the, the listening audience, if you wanna be a part of that, please join us. Um, Cause I think we got a little bit of work to do moving forward. Um, let me jump to another question. Um, what services are available to help uh, mobility challenged people with disabilities get vaccinated? Um, uh, yeah, so the health, the, actually the Lucas County Health Department has put in place several programs uh, to help folks get vaccinated um, and to help folks get transportation um, to vaccination centers. Um, so, um, so I would definitely reach, I just reach out to them. They do have a COVID call line, or you can reach out to 211, um, which is able to connect folks to that program. Uh, that's something 
that the Ability Center did work with uh, the health department to ensure that set up um, earlier this year. Okay, great. Um, another question. I would imagine, I just lost it, hold on. <laughs> okay, here we go. I would imagine that all the difficulties, fear, and isolation affected people with disabilities experienced negatively affected their mental health. Does the Ability Center address this? And are there services that can assist? Um, and yes, I think, um, you know, I, I'm an advocate and not a medical provider, um, but I would imagine that um, mental health crisis um, has been another big point of this pandemic altogether. Um, I, again, was just, uh, bowled over by the responses of the amount of fear that people felt. Um, I mean, that was really the majority of folks who responded felt in fear of their life. Um, so I, I would imagine that there will definitely be uh, mental health repercussions, um, you know, for a lot of folks with disabilities um, during the pandemic. Um, I, um, uh, Toledo does have a number of, you know, mental health services um, available here. Um, we, um, we do not offer that at the Ability Center, um, but, um, but I would encourage anyone um, who, who would like uh, some support um, in that area, you know, to reach out to the other mental health providers um, in our area. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, another question, uh, maybe there's something missing, but let me read it as it is and um, we'll try to improvise. Do you find higher disparities among people of color who live in poverty? And so why don't we insert um, individuals with disabilities? And so uh, maybe uh, the question really is, is there um, higher disparities amongst individuals with disabilities amongst people of color? Uh, and if I, I mess that up, whoever wrote it, please correct me. <laughs> So um, we did not include that in our survey. Our, uh, our survey was fairly short um, and kind of to the point, um, but I really think that that was an oversight. Um, we um, have been a part of state, um, like the State Department of Health has been really trying to pay attention to this issue. It might've been a little slow in responding to that, um, but they have been doing a number of their own surveys um, to look for um, you know, disparities in um, and health equity um, for a number of different minority populations. Um, in my experience, um, if, you, if there's intersectionality, if, if a person falls into uh, more than one um, uh, you know, group, um, the effects um, that we measure tend to be enhanced. Um, so for example, a person of color who has a disability um, would likely be um, more affected than even a person who is not of color who has a disability. Um, in my experience, that tend, there tends to be an overlap there um, in, in areas when we do studies like this. Um, so there may be some data available, more specific data available for that um, from the state health department, because I know that they, um, they developed a committee um, to try and look at the impact of the pandemic um, on um, minority communities um, and um, have developed, I think, a diversity and inclusion lead there. Um, so I'm, they probably would have better data on that. My guess would be that, um, that the impact of COVID on folks who fall into more uh, than one of those groups would probably be even greater than those who do not. Okay, great, thank you. Um, why don't we go to one of my questions we may have asked all the questions in the chat. Um, while you were talking, I made a note about the digital divide. Um, you know, it, it seems to keep rearing its head in um, almost every instance of difficulties that's happening amongst us as a result of COVID. I'm just curious to know if you know of any legislation that is set to funnel down um, to address resources and the lack of internet for communities that are lacking in that area. And so um, listening to you earlier, you mentioned that many folks couldn't access telehealth. Um, you know, they weren't getting current information because they lacked the internet. 
um, it, it, I've heard the same argument with education and children. I'm just curious to know if there's anybody else higher up, much more uh, uh, you know, advanced in technology than, than us that's also recognized that. And if they've been so strong in taking a position that there's a plan to make the internet universal. Oh, that's a really good question. So I've heard um, dialogue on that issue um, and rumors, um, but I'm not sure if I, I would not be able to identify specific legislation. I do know it was discussed as part of the federal infrastructure bill that's currently being um, debated, but I don't know if it made it into the final bill. Um, so, um, but that, I think that's a really great question. Um, I, I, you know, um, digital equity is another one of those issues that really came under a spotlight during the pandemic, uh, especially for folks with disabilities who need access to medical care and regular medical appointments to manage disabilities um, during the shelter in place um, period. The only thing available really was um, telehealth. Um, and, um, and a lot of folks had to go without care because they didn't have access to the, to the internet. Um, I think uh, the disparities that that shows um, have really been highlighted. Um, and I hope that somebody does push legislation that would make it available to folks. Um, but, I, but I have heard dialogue and rumors um, and I heard that it was being considered as part of the federal infrastructure bill, but I'm not aware of whether it ended up in the final bill and I, I'm not aware of other legislation. I haven't heard it either. Well, uh, there you go, listeners. Anyone that is as interested as the YWCA um, in this topic and the Ability Center, I encourage you to reach out to legislators, um, even uh, attend some of the meetings that the city is um, having regarding the rescue funds that are coming in. It, it's important, again, that we are leveling the, the playing field and having access to uh, digital technology is one of the best ways to do that. Um, it looks like we are maybe done with our questions. Let me just make sure. So it looks like we will actually let folks go a little early. Um, so let me encourage people, <clears throat> excuse me, if you have not uh, clicked on the link uh, to complete the evaluation to please do so. Um, you will be uh, routed to the actual document and once you're done, just click exit and you'll come right back to the main stage. Um, it is really a tool that allows us to really gauge uh, really if we're hitting the mark. If there are any uh, additional educations that you are interested in, if you know of any organizations or individuals that are doing some great work, and really addressing the causes of health equity, please take the time to jot it um, down in the evaluation so that we can contact those individuals and um, bring another session to you. Um, let me just spend just a couple of minutes before I close just uh, sharing some additional resources with you about the YWCA. Um, I encourage you to consider joining us on August 30th at 6 p.m. for a community book discussion. Right now, we are reading The Good Immigrant. It's uh, about 26 artists and scholars who are immigrants um, from various countries who reflect on race, ethnicity, nationality, and an issue of belonging. Uh, you can register um, on the YWCA website and you can access the book at the Toledo Public Library. Um, we are continuing our work in advocacy as it relates to racism as a public health crisis, um, not only here on um, a state and national level, but we are very, very excited about the work that we are doing around TREC which is the acronym Toledo Racial Equity and Inclusion Council. Um, I am very happy to serve as one of the co-chairs for that community coalition, along with Bob LeClaire, the former president and CEO of Fifth Third Bank. Um, anyone who is interested 
and helping uh, push this agenda of health equity um, in the areas of education, um, healthcare, uh, social justice, uh, workforce development. I shouldn't have started naming them because now I'm not going to get them all right. But uh, contact us so we can get you plugged into a, a pillar work group. Um, the other thing I just want to say really quickly in passing is um, we are gearing up for another 21 day uh, racial justice, social um, equity challenge. Um, so we will uh, be sharing information with you in the very near future. Planning is underway for 2022 YWCA Stand Against Racism. And we are always looking for community partners to help us frame um, the conference. And so if you are interested in either of those things, please contact us. And, and then last but not least, um, the work that we do around dialogue to change. Um, we are tiptoeing around trying to uh, bring that back to you in person. Um, if we are able um, to uh, really set that up where we're not as concerned about Delta and Lambda and whatever other one that may be coming, uh, we will get the information out in front of you. But in the meantime, we can do some individual um, racial justice education for you via Zoom. So if you're interested in that, again, feel free to contact us uh, via our website or by calling us directly. Um, this has been wonderful. Katie, it's a pleasure to officially lay eyes on you. Um, and I thank you for the wonderful information you shared with our group. Uh, Jan Ruma, and on behalf of Healthy Lucas County and the YWCA, thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us for yet another Lunch and Learn. See you next month. Bye-bye.